right, well, good morning. Come on, who's excited to be here this morning? Excited to be in the house of the Lord. It's always good worshiping with our family. We want to welcome everybody to our Ashland campus as well and online. We start a brand new series today called Broken Soundtrack. So come on, let's kind of date ourselves here this morning. So there's no shame in your game. I want you to raise your hand. And everybody at our Ashland campus, I want you to participate as well. How many of you, not that you heard about it, not that you even saw it in your history book, but you actually experienced it yourself. How many of you remember eight tracks that were in cars? Come on, get your hands up. Eight tracks, and y'all think we're like a young church. Look at all my old folks in the house. Eight tracks, I remember eight tracks. I remember as a little kid, you get in the car. If you don't know what it is, Google it, all right? It's an eight track, and, and you had to push it in, you pop it, had to push it, and you pull it out, and I would never forget, you know, as a little kid, you tried to switch those out, and I really didn't understand, I was really little, but I remember the eight tracks. So goodness gracious, a bunch of you guys did. Okay, how many of you remember, and you actually, you don't just know about it, but you actually used it, a record player. Come on, record players. If you had an eight track and a record player, get your hands. Okay, get a little bit more there, a little bit more participation as well. Now, some of you, I know y'all ain't gonna believe this, but how many of you actually used a physical cassette tape and come on, there we go, there we go. And today, digital music, who uses digital music? Come on, everybody now, right? That's all of us. We don't even have CD players hardly anymore. And that's why some of you hold on to your old car right now because you still have the CD player. And you remember the CD player? You used to have those in like in that big vinyl thing. You had to flip it, you're trying to drive. Like don't text and drive, don't get a CD out and drive. Like you had to keep flipping through, finding the CD that you wanted to use, right? And so, uh, but anyway, we're gonna talk about, how, about broken soundtracks. Now today I, I brought some of my, my mother-in-law, she had some of these because she keeps everything, and, um, but that's good. And so we have some records that we used to use when we was a little kid. Here's one, the original, all the way back from Dr. Seuss' favorite records. We have a record player at home. My little girl loves playing records, so we play records all the time. Yes, don't judge me. And so this one, this one's really, really good. Um, her new, one of her favorites now is the Cabbage Patch Kids record. Come on, how many remember the Cabbage Patch Kids? I still have mine. Don't judge me, okay? You remember the Cabbage Patch. Like, this was always, always good. And then my wife's favorite, maybe not her favorite a, a person who sings, but one of her favorite albums is Merry Christmas by Bing Crosby. This one here, Crosby, this one right here is like vintage. We're going on eBay, starting a bit at a thousand, right? Going like, this one really is vintage. I mean, really, like I had like, beg her, let me take this out of the house because it's so old. And so this is the vinyl, right? This is the record. And if you ever played one of these record plays before, if you remember as a kid, if you ever messed with, if it ever got scratched, it's over. Same way with like a CD. And so what happened if it gets scratched, if you remember, you put the record on and it would get stuck on an endless loop. I never forget, I, was, I had one called, and some of you may remember this, the Monster Mash. Anybody remember the Monster Mash? Come on, like, we're having so much 80s fun right now, like the Monster Mash. And I remember as a little boy, I'd put on, and we played the Monster Mash, and I'd sit in my sister's room, and we'd all sing the Monster Mash, and all of a sudden, the, it was scratched, and we got stuck. The Monster Mash, the Monster Mash, the Monster Mash, the Monster Mash, right? You know, and it gets stuck on. You have to go, and you, you flip the thing over and push it over to the next one, miss half the song, because the record got scratched. But today I wanna to talk a little bit about the scratch that's in us and, and, and the brokenness that's in us that for a lot of times we have this broken endless loops of the thoughts in our mind that go over and over and over and over and they repeat themselves over and over and over. And so today we're gonna to focus on broken soundtracks. What are these soundtracks that keep going over and over and over in our heads, in our minds, and what are some things we could do to fix the broken soundtrack? So I'm really, really excited about this because a lot of times what we wanna do is we, and I'm gonna speak to myself, is that we wanna just flip a switch. We think if we can just flip the switch, that maybe if we just flip the switch, that it fixed the broken soundtrack. And so what we'll try to do, right, we'll, we'll go in the breathing technique for anxiety, relax your body. It kicked off your, 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 your nervous system and you breathe well and for a moment it, it, it calmed you down and if I just flip the switch and maybe it will go away forever. Maybe the book that you're reading, the self-help book or something gave some great, fantastic insight to your situation and you're trying to find a switch to flip off to stop the endless loop that goes over and over and over. 
Maybe you're like me, you went to the counseling session. You think, man, if I go to counseling, then maybe the counselor will fix me and my problems will get fixed and the endless sleep will stop. I need a switch. I just want to turn this off. Or maybe, you know, a week later down the road, that works for a while. The counseling session worked. The book helped. The breathing technique calmed you down from your anxiety. But then a week, a month, a year, a day later, bam, there it is again. And so what we look for is we look for a switch to turn off. And really, here's what I've come just in my own life, what I've realized is that it's still there. It's still there broken over and over and over, an endless loop. How do I fix that? And so what I really came to the conclusion, and unless there's something else that just really walking through and discover this, is that I, there's not a switch to flip that off. My mind is broken. Our world is broken. Sin has broken all of us. I have the devil, the flesh, the world against me. And so how do I get to the point, and watch it, here's what I've been trying to do in my own life, it's not find the switch that flips it and cures it and it's gone because at this point, as a 46-year-old man, I have not found that to be true. But what I have discovered, what I have been doing is how do I turn the dial down that it's not loud anymore and it yells at me? How do I turn the dial down that when it, when it does speak its ugly head or when it does speak the lines of my life, it doesn't affect me as much or it doesn't affect me anymore? How do I turn that dial down on the noise that's in my life, especially the broken soundtracks? And so instead of fighting it, let's flip it. Let's flip the script. Let's choose new thoughts that produce new feelings that require new action that would take all of us to new places with ourselves and in our life. This is very important because what we believe will determine how we live. And so if we're always walking around with broken soundtracks in our mind, then it's, we're gonna live a broken life. And that's not what God wants for us. God came to have an abundant life, a full life. We like to say, the message paraphrase, a better life than you've ever dreamed of. So how is that possible? How do we fix the brokenness that's in our mind? Now, full disclaimer. This series in the month of May is gonna be targeted and focusing towards, toward the ladies, to the women in the house. Now listen, if you're a dude, listen, this is, this is still for you. This is gonna to apply to you. Hang tight, we have a series for men coming up in June. And, but a full disclaimer. I'm not a woman. And there's only two things you need to know about women. And the problem is no one knows what they are. Because everyone's different, everyone's wired different. So as a guy, if I say something dumb, please give me grace, okay, ladies? Like, I, I'm not a lady. It's, and so I cannot say within the next 20 minutes or the next 30 days of a sermon series that we're gonna fix all the broken soundtracks in your mind. What I really wanna do is just bring attention to it that you already know and then figure out what are some tools I can take to turn down the dial because there's not a switch you're gonna flip and it's all gonna be gone to turn down the noise in your life so that you can be everything that God wants you to be. And that's really what I wanna focus on today, these broken soundtracks. Now for ladies, listen, I've interviewed a bunch of ladies, I've texted a lot of ladies asking advice and their opinion, I've sent out emails, I've read, I've read books, I've, I've, I've searched articles, I've tried my best to be just to do due diligence and research by asking ladies, what are some of the problems you struggle? What are some of the lies that you're believing? What are some of the negative beliefs? What are some of the broken soundtracks that keep going over and over and over in your mind? A lot of them came to the top, and they would be really honest, is that I'm not worth anything. I'm not worth anything. Or I'll never catch up. I'm always busy. There's never enough time to do what, the things that I wanna do. I feel guilty if I take time for myself, especially as moms. I feel guilty if, if I just stop and put everything to the side and just take time for myself and I, I feel bad. I'm not good enough. I should not have to live with unfulfilled longings is one of them. And one that rose to the top, all the way to the top, was this, was this thought of I'm not pretty, which is written I'm not good enough. I'll never look like. I'll never be like, I think of this about myself. I think this about my body. I think this about my look. And what, and what it was focusing on is that I don't believe that I'm beautiful. Yeah, I may have some inner beauty thing, but I, or, or maybe not, but really the outside of who I am, I'm not pleased with who I look at when I look into a mirror. Where did that come from? 
Where did the broken soundtrack of this have to look, have to be, have to feel about it? So where did this broken soundtrack come from? That really that physical beauty is way more important than inner beauty. And how that inner beauty is not enough if there's no physical beauty and you get to define physical beauty through your eyes. Where did this broken soundtrack begin? Because the world spends billions and billions of dollars in, in commercials and in, in ads telling women you gotta look this way, your hair has to look this way, you have to weigh this much, and if you're not this, you are not beautiful. Where did that happen? Where did that come from? My little girl, I, my love language is words of affirmation, all the way to the top. My wife got a zero in that love language. Hers is act of service. I got a zero in her love language. But you speak out of your love language. So I'm always affirming my wife. I'm always affirming my kids. I'm always talking about how proud. And I'm not proud of you because you are beautiful. I'm not proud of you because you good, good, did good in school. I'm not proud of you because of sports. You could ask any of my kids, walk up to them and catch them off guard and ask them, why is your dad proud of you? And this is the exact thing they will tell you. Because I'm his son. Because I'm his daughter. That's the only reason. You don't have to do anything to make me pleased with you or proud for you. Because we know a lot of issues, especially with ladies, come from father issues. And I didn't want that to be in my children. I want them to know dad's proud of them, not based on their performance, but based because they're mine. I tell them all the time, God could give me any kid on the planet, but he gave me you. And I look at my little daughter, who's my favorite, I tell her that all the time. And I've told her for, since she was born, you are amazing, you are beautiful. How in the world, God has made you adorable. I have spoke positivity, I have spoke affirmation, not only to my wife for the last 24 years, but to my daughter over and over and over. And a little girl comes home from school Seven years old. Daddy, do you think I'm pretty? Do you think I'm beautiful? Where did this come from? Little girls, listen to me, ladies. You have been indoctrinated from day one. And you wonder now, as beauty begins to fade, as the scripture says, and I'll show you that just in a moment, and we all know that from the outside picture that we will grow and be frail. That's life. But even now as a 40, 50, 30, 20, 19, seven, I don't feel pretty. Where does this come from? Where does this broken soundtrack that's only, because listen, this comes, this has so much more effect in our lives than you can imagine. And not that all guys struggle with it or even all girls struggle with that, but you'd be amazed at the guys who even struggle with their physical appearance and they don't feel attractive and they don't feel like this, especially as they get older and things begin to change in their life and ladies, same with you, I don't feel attractive anymore. It's not just a, a girl thing. This has affect all of us because sin has entered into the world that we all have this broken soundtrack that I'm not attractive, that I'm not beautiful, I'm not good enough. And so where did this come from? So let's go all the way back to Genesis. And if you have your Bibles, go with me to Genesis chapter three. I'm using the New Living Translation this morning. Let's go back to Genesis. And I just wanna, I wanna, I wanna show you one of the, the lies that Satan pulled in Eve that now has been passed down to every single one of us with this broken soundtrack over and over and over. I'm not good enough. I'm not attractive. I will not look like, and then you fill in the blank. Genesis chapter three, verse one. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say that you must not eat the fruit from any tree in the garden? Did God really say that? He, Satan always tests God's word. 
Satan will always go against God's word. Did God really say marriage is between just one man, woman? Did God say that you can't have sex before you get married? Did God really say that, does God, is God's word true when there's a bunch of old men wrote about it? How do you know the Bible is true? And is, did God really say he's going to attack God's word? He's done this since day one. He goes to Jesus and attacks Jesus. It is written, throw yourself down. He is quoting scripture to the author of scripture it's one of satan's biggest attack did god really say wants to question god's word and look what she says of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden the woman replied but it's only the fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat because god said you must not eat it or even touch it I don't believe God said you'd not touch it. He told Adam not to eat it. If you do, you will die. Now, where does she hear that from? See, Eve wasn't even created yet when God told Adam not to eat from that tree. It was man's responsibility to make sure that his wife knows that she should not eat from the tree. Eve was not there. The Bible says Eve was deceived by the serpent, but Adam wasn't deceived. Because Adam knew, and he did it anyway. And when God came down and spoke to them, who did he call for? The man. Because the man was responsible for the action that took place. And he goes after the man. Adam, where are you? So she's having this conversation as she was told from Adam that we cannot eat from that tree he probably even added, don't even touch the tree. Don't even get near the tree because she adds, don't touch it. And then listen to what happens. Listen to what he says. You won't die. Well, no, not physically. Half truth. Half truth. You're not going to die today physically by taking a bob of fruit. Half truth. The serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes, and this is it, your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, and you'll know good and evil. And the woman was convinced, and she saw the tree that was beautiful. Its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took the fruit and ate it. She was deceived. Then she gave some to her husband, who was not deceived. Because he knew. Because God clearly, audibly told him who was with her, and he ate it too. I love the NET translation on this verse six here. It says, when the woman saw the tree produce fruit that was good for food, and then what's what it says, and was attractive to the eye. One of the temptations that the devil won the woman over with was physical beauty of the fruit. It was good for the body, the flesh, is physically beauty. This was what lust of the eye, and it made her wise like God, which is the pride of life. Every single sin will fall in one of those three things in your life. It's gonna be the lust of your flesh, the lust of the eye, or the pride of life. Lust of the flesh, passion. Lust of the eye, Possession. I want what it has. I want that in life. I want what you have. I'm a lust for this possession. I want to look the way that you look. We could go on and on and on. And then the pride of life. This is the possessions, the things that you have, your position in life. Sin will be fallen one of those three categories. We see this over and over and over. And then at verse seven, here it is. Watch this. Watch this. At this moment, their eyes were open and they suddenly felt shame of their nakedness. Instantly, sin entered the world and instantly Eve was embarrassed of her body. Instantly, Adam was embarrassed of his body. Instantly, they both knew something was wrong and I'm not attractive anymore. And from day one, this has entered in when you have a little girl who's been affirmed her entire life and we don't let her watch ads and we don't let her watch stuff that she shouldn't be watching. We've done everything we can to protect her. She comes home and she asks the question, Daddy, am I pretty? 
And the devil is gonna do everything he can to destroy you, to make you feel less attractive. And he's been using this temptation over and over and over. They hid themselves, they clothed themselves because they were ashamed of their nakedness. And we scratch our head today and wonder why is it still happening today? It has been passed down from generation to generation, this broken soundtrack. And when you have a false view of beauty, when you have a false view of beauty, let me just really quickly, I'm gonna blitz this out. One, you begin to compare yourself. I'm not as pretty as her. I don't look like her. And one of the most damning things that's gonna go after your attention is that when you get on social media and you see everybody's highlight reels, and they're dressed to the nine, and you feel like I'm just plain, I'm not as pretty as them, my family don't look like them, I wish I weighed like her, I wish my hair looked like her, and you endlessly salute and scroll, and you see everyone's highlight reel, and you compare it to your flaws. And you open yourself wide open for the enemy to continue to speak negative into your life, lies into your life. And the broken soundtrack comes back up again. Well, I wish I was attractive. I wish I looked like, I wish I weighed. I wish I, and we do everything we can to change, to fit into a mold that the world said this is what beauty looks like. It leads to envy and jealousy. Do you know the difference between envy and jealousy? Most people don't use the word envy anymore. We use the word jealousy. Envy and jealousy are a little different, even though they come from the same word, they're a little different. Envy says this, I want to be as pretty as you. I envy you. I want to be as pretty as you. Jealousy says this, I don't want you to be as pretty as me. There's a difference between envy and jealousy. Where do you fall in that camp? I wish I was as pretty as you. I envy you. Or you think how beautiful you are and now you're jealous if someone else is pretty. I don't want you to be as pretty as me though. Don't look like me. You can't look as good as me. It's both sides. It produces envy and jealousy. Competitiveness, you'll be competitive in what you do in your life. Sexual sins. Ladies have told me I've tried to make myself feel pretty and be attractive and wanted by giving into sexual temptation so that he would love me, like me, feel good about me, that makes me feel good about myself, but every time I do the sexual sin, then I feel bad about myself, and this vicious, endless cycle never ends. I wanna feel good, and for a moment I do, and then I feel bad about myself. Over and over and over, and you'll give in to sexual temptation because you want someone to be attractive and feel good about yourself. This is a huge lie from the enemy destroying people's life. Not all eating disorders, but the ones I've talked to as well, I don't feel pretty, therefore I have an eating disorder in my life. I think I'm too fat, I think I'm too skinny, whatever it may be, leads to an eating disorder in their life. In modest dress, I'm gonna dress a certain way to be attracted, to feel attracted, to get attention to myself. And you think by doing this, you allow people to look at you to make you feel good about yourself. So you'll dress a certain way, you'll act a certain way, you'll look a certain way to bring attention to yourself, to make you feel good about yourself. Or a flirtatious behavior, you will flirt a certain way because you like the attention. And usually this is where affairs and marriages start to go south because most people have an affair, it's usually somebody at work, someone close, someone they know, not just some person they just met. It begins with flirtations, and I'm not being flirted with at home, I'm not having attention at home, why do you give attention to me? And the next thing you know, you start dressing up, trying to be better, look better when you go to work. Man, it's a, man, it's a bookcase right now, and you can, just, you can see it happening. That's why right now, if you're flirting with someone at work and you're married, listen to me right now, you better break that stuff off now. You'll have an emotional affair way before it becomes physical. And it's all filtered in this lie that I'm not attractive and no one's showing me attention. I need attention. I need to be attractive. And as I look and I'll dress and I feel and I flirt, it's exactly what the enemy wants. And it's broken soundtrack loops over and over and over. So Proverbs 31, 30 says this, charm is deceptive. Beauty does not last. But a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. 
Peter goes on and says, don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, and beautiful clothes. Now let me stop. The Bible does not condemn beauty. The Bible is not against you fixing your hair, wearing makeup, having nice things, dressing nice. It is not. It's about when you find your self-image in how you look, when you find your security and your appearance because you're trying to be attracted for someone instead of your security who Christ says you are. It's the motive of your heart, not the outward. God doesn't look at the outward. He tells us, Samuel, he looks at the inward of the heart. That's why he said it's the inner beauty. Look, you should clothe yourself instead, verse four, with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. If you have a poor self-image, you have a poor God image. And this is one of the broken soundtracks the enemy wants you over and over and over, especially to ladies. And listen, it's not just ladies. Guys, guys just don't usually verbalize it. And so what do you do? So what do you do? Can I fix that? Can I, I wish I had a switch we could just all flip the switch off right now and it's done, it's gone. I wish I could grab my eight-year-old daughter, speak something, flip that switch, and she never has to think that. Even though I affirm her every single day, there's not a day of her life. Every time I drop her off at school, she'll look at me and she'll say, Daddy, anything on my face? And I say, absolutely, beauty. Gorgeous. How are you so pretty? And what she wants to know, do I have any jelly, Dad, on my face? Do I have any crumbs on my face? And I tell her, every, you can ask her, every time she gets out of the car, beauty because I want her father to affirm her over and over and over. She don't have to hear it from some other guy. She ain't getting married since she's 25 anyway. I wanna hear it from me. And so what do you do? I have three questions. Ladies, three questions that I want you. Three questions in the next three minutes. Let's go, pray for me. Three questions. Psalms 4510, listen to what it says. Listen, old daughter, Give attention and incline your ear. Forget your people in your father's house, then the king will desire your beauty because he is your Lord. Bow down to him. Three questions. It says, daughter, give attention and incline your ear. Listen to me, ladies. Here's a question. Write this down. Who am I listening to? Who am I listening to? What broken soundtrack in my mind that I'm listening to over and over and over? What article, what blog post, what social media group that I follow? What world says? What have people said? What about the lie that was spoken to me when I was a kid when someone told me I wasn't pretty? And now you carry that over even as an adult. Stop for a moment, dissect this and ask, who am I listening to? What, what is this thought that's coming to me? And then it says, the king will desire, which means he'll enthrall your beauty. Second question, what does God think about me? What does God think about me? What is his thoughts towards me? I love this verse in Psalms 139. It says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mom's womb. That's why your pastor believes that life starts at conception. I do not apologize for being pro-life to anybody. Not one person. And he says right here, and that's not being mean or slammed because I've talked to him, counseled many, many women who've had abortions and who have struggled with the guilt and the shame that's come from that. Even men who have talked their girlfriends into doing it who have struggled with the guilt and the shame from it. There is grace and God loves you and we can work through those things. I'm here to tell you, here's what God says about it in his word, that he's in the delicate inner parts of my body, he knit me together in my mother's womb. Look what he says in verse 14. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. If that does not describe a woman, I don't know what does. She is wonderfully complex. Beautifully complex. Wonderful and it's complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. Oh, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. I was woven together in the darkness of the womb. You saw me before I was born. God knew every freckle you have. He knew the color of your hair. He knew the color of your eyes. He knew the color of your skin. He knows everything about you. 
He knows your genes, your DNA. He knows everything about you. And he says, you're wonderfully complex. Now watch this. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. God knows when you breathe your first. God knows when you breathe your last. He knows all in between. He knows everything. Verse 17, how precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. Do you see that? God's thoughts are precious towards you. They cannot even be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of the sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. Your thoughts towards me. Listen, you should let that just sink into your soul, into your spirit. That his thoughts about you, ladies, are precious. And they outnumber the grains of sand on the planet. That's how much your heavenly father loves you. And that's his thoughts towards you. So the question is, who am I listening to? And I gotta discover, what does God think about me? What are God's thoughts towards me? This is a way to begin to turn the dial down on the broken soundtrack, the endless loop. And I don't know what it ends specifically for you. And that's for you to go and dissect that loop that keeps playing over and over and over when it comes to physical beauty or attractive or, or the desire. You're valuable. Genesis 1, 2, 7 says probably one of the most valuable things. It says God made us in his image. How valuable. It tells us here in Ephesians 2, 10 that we are God's workmanship. That means we're his creative work. You're valuable. And then last third question is this. Who am I listening to? What has God thought about me? And then who am I going to live for? Who are you going to live for? Who are you going to live for? I'm gonna live what the world says, what physical beauty and attractive looks like. And again, there's nothing wrong with beauty. There's nothing wrong with fixing your hair. There's nothing wrong with having nice clothes. I'm not saying that. It's the motive behind it of the why. The Bible doesn't condemn physical beauty. But it's the why the drive behind it. Who am I going to listen for? Because it says here in the verse 145, because he is your Lord, bow down to him. Am I gonna live forever people, other people's highlight reels on social media? I'm gonna live what Glamour Magazine has to say what true beauty is? Am I gonna be someone that a guy wants me to be so I feel better about myself to make him feel good about himself, that I feel better about myself and inside I don't feel better about myself? Am I gonna live for him? Let's go a step further. Am I gonna live for self? Am I gonna live for self so I'm gonna do this, be this, act like this to make me feel attractive, to make me feel good, to make me feel better about myself? Or are we gonna bow down low and say, no, you're the king and I'm gonna live for you and I'm, gonna, I'm going to fill my mind. I talked about this a couple weeks ago, right? Victory for that. I'm gonna fill my mind when that thought comes, this is what Jesus says about me. This is what God says about me. This is what the scripture says about me. Here's God's thoughts towards me. And yeah, I'm gonna eat good exercise. I'm gonna do the very best I can, but it's not for the vanity of this world. Because I know who I am and whose I am. To the king. So here's the conclusion. We gotta flip the script. We can't fight it, we gotta flip it. We gotta change the broken sound check. You want an endless loop in your mind? If you want a constant endless loop over and over and over, let the word of God be that. That's what meditation means. And I'm gonna meditate on God's word. That's what it says, meditate on God's word day and night. I'm gonna meditate on what God has to say over and over and over. I'm gonna put that on the loop, who he says I am. And then what happens is, watch this, that negative voice from the flesh or the devil that's gonna fight against you, watch this, for the rest of your life. We're gonna turn the dial down. And though it may hear it, and though it may come across your mind, but you've been running the endless loop of what God has to say about you, and therefore it don't affect you anymore. And that's what I want for every single one of us. And that's what we talked about a couple weeks ago. We gotta stop listening to ourselves and start preaching to ourselves what God's word has to say about us. I'm gonna ask you uh, just to bow your heads just for a moment.
God created you. And God loves you. And if you put your faith and trust in Him, He has redeemed you. Paid for you for a price. His Son's precious blood. That so whosoever will believe, though you may ha have broken soundtracks, <laughs> you will have eternal life. And eternal life does not begin when you die. It begins now. You can experience eternity now by giving your life to Jesus. And by giving your life to Jesus, it's not going to make your life easier, per se. It's not going to take all the bad things away. And we say it all the time, it's not the absence of pain. It's the presence of Jesus walking through your pain. And some of you have some really deep emotional scars from abuse, physical, verbal, ladies in your life that has ingrained a broken scar soundtrack over and over and over. And though that scar may be there forever, you can't flip the switch and turn it off, but boy, we can begin to turn down the dial Turn down the volume of that by receiving God's grace, meditating on his word, and putting it on an endless loop in our mind as we surrender to him. It will not take the pain or the scar away, but it will give you the grace to live today. And eventually the power to use your scars and your pain to minister to other people. And the greatest thing you could do today, though, is give your life to Jesus. He loves you. He created you. He knows everything about you. He's got the, your days ordained. And I beg you to surrender your life to him. And you could do that by saying, Jesus, I believe. I believe you came for me. I believe you died for me. And today I believe you got up out of the grave for me. And as best as I know how, I don't care if you're in Ashland, you're watching online. Today, as best as I know how, I surrender and give my life to you. I repent of my sin. Now help me follow you all the days of my life. If that's you, just in a moment, your campus pastor or host are gonna come out. They're gonna share with you your next step. Please take it, because we wanna help you follow Jesus. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how relevant it is today. God, I pray for all the broken soundtracks we're gonna talk about over the next few weeks, especially the one today. God, is the devil still gonna keep throwing it up in our life? Probably for the rest of our life. I pray we would get to the point where we put your word on our endless loop, that even though we hear it, it don't affect us emotionally anymore. Even though we hear it, it don't affect us how we live anymore. And even though we hear it, it's not what drives us to become. It is your word that overpowers that. It is your word that speaks louder than the voice of the enemy of our flesh. And God, I can't wait to see how you going to move through our lives through this series. For it's your name we ask and we pray. And everybody said, amen.